Uh, welcome to Ancestral Connections, another Wheeler Centre virtual event in conjunction with the National Gallery of Victoria. My name is Daniel James and over the course of the next hour, I and our three fabulous guests will have a discussion about art and cultural practice as a form of res resistance ever since invasion. So before we kick off proceedings, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation, and we also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we all watch today. And to First Nations people participating in this event, we pay our respects to their elders past and present. So along with storytelling and language, the practice of art and culture has been an act of defiance against forces that would not only have these practices disappear, but would also like to see the people, their beliefs and their race vanish along with them. The fact that we are here in 2021 with a thriving First Nations art scene is an astounding accomplishment by those who practice their art today and all those that have come before us. The warriors, the poets, the painters, the agitators, and those who quietly and lovingly have done all they could to keep them and their loved ones safe from the tumult of colonialism. All these threads weave themselves in and around one, eye, one another to form identity. So we are very fortunate today to have three exponents of art and words who have had and continue to have a key role in ensuring our stories and our culture continue to flourish. Um, Marie Clark is a Yorta Yorta Wamba Wamba Muddy Muddy Bunurung woman who grew up in northeast Victoria, mainly in and around Mildura. Marie has been a practicing artist living and working in Melbourne for the last three decades and is a pivotal figure in the reclamation of Southeast Australian Aboriginal art practices, reviving elements of Aboriginal culture that were lost or laying dormant over the period of colonisation. Her exhibition, Ancestral Memories, is on at the E.M. Potter Centre for, at the National Gallery of Victoria until the 3rd of October. Marie, welcome. Thank you. Claire G. Coleman is a Noongar woman whose family have belonged to the south coast of Western Australia since long before history started being recorded. Claire writes fiction, essays, poetry and art writing while living here in Melbourne or Nam or on the road. During a, an extended circuit of the continent, she wrote a novel, Terra Nullius, a fantastic piece of work, which won Black and, Ro Black and Right Indigenous Writing Fellowship and was listed for eight awards, including shortlisting for the Stella Prize. Lies, Damn Lies is her first full-length work of non-fiction and is available through the online bookseller for this event, The Hill of Content Bookshop, uh, which we'll visit uh, later on. But if you want to buy that book uh, at any point during our discussion, you can go to hillofcontentbookshop.com. Claire, welcome. Hey, good to be here. And Miles Russell Cook is Acting Senior Curator of Indigenous Art at the National Gallery of Victoria. Miles has a passion for First Nations contemporary art. He has published extensively on art, design and fashion and curated a number of exhibitions at the NGV. Miles derives much personal and professional influence and inspiration from his maternal Aboriginal heritage of Western Victoria with connections into Tasmania and the Bass Strait Islands. Miles, welcome. Thanks very much for having us. And also, I should just okay. say that Marie's been extended, so it's actually going to be open until February, which is super exciting. Oh, fantastic. So gonna, yeah. Have you got the date for that? Uh, oh, no, uh, it'll be announced pretty soon, so you'll be able to check on the website. But, yeah, we've only just had the green light for that. So, oh, that's so fantastic much of the show news. is locked down. <laughs> but, yeah, yes, fantastic. Okay, well, let's start with you, Marie. Um, let's start with your um, with your exhibition. Congratulations on it. Um, I've only seen it virtually, unfortunately, like most of us, but now I'll get a chance to see it physically. Um, your work is based on on memory. Um, thinking broadly about where you were in the world when you started your um, artistic expression, um, what were some of the early challenges you faced as an Aboriginal artist? Um, I think. It like for me and because I've been sort of doing this for so long and, and trying to get Southeast Australian Aboriginal art recognised mm -hmm. and on the map. So basically I started off in Muldura um, setting up an Aboriginal art shop through the local Aboriginal corporation and started off as a jewellery maker and sort of went from there to creating public art commissions and curating exhibitions and then started researching in museum collections and seeing those objects and items and um, 
yeah, you know, looking at the carved shields and all those beautiful designs on there and um, then eventually seeing the the river reed necklaces and kangaroo tooth necklaces and having a background in, in jewellery, jewellery making, um, yeah, I just wanted to sort of revive these practices that haven't been practised for a long, long time. Seems to me that um, a lot of Aboriginal artists actually start off with uh, jewellery making as as a, as a form of artistic expression and that really mm. lends itself to, to sort of as a starting point to, to build on um, your artistic um, practices. Um, mm. Let me just, um, you know, to get the conversation uh, rolling here, let me just throw open a question that anyone can then uh, pop their hand up and, and answer. Um, mm. It seems to me that we're at a really, you know, defining point in terms of the history of, of this state with uh, treaty and truth telling and um, all that goes around that. Um, do you think the, the broader community is ready to hear what is about to be said and what role does art and storytelling has that had in laying the groundwork for this moment? So anyone want to put their hand up for that one is fine by me. Well, I think, I, um, I think that art is an amazing soft entry for a lot of people into really difficult conversations. And art has been such an, particularly, you know, obviously Indigenous art has been such an amazing act of generosity from Aboriginal artists in this country because there's really no reason why Aboriginal people should volunteer any sort of um, gift or sharing of culture to be consumed by a kind of a broader audience. But yet we have so many artists who really are using their work. Marie is, a, is, a, is an amazing example as a way of, I guess, sharing with with everybody, with settlers, with uh, people who have recently come to Australia, with people who are visiting Australia, um, and just sharing a part of what it means to be on country and to be here and to be connected to 65,000 years worth of history. So it's, um, yeah, I suppose I would say it's an amazingly generous act. And I think that the role that art has played is one in kind of helping people to to consider and to, to question what it means to actually be in this place in Australia. Clay, uh, if you I, can, if I can add. Yeah, sure, go. Yep. If, if I can just add to that, um, it's my experience in um, examining, studying, researching and looking into the art history of this country. Uh, protest art has been a long, um, has been a part of the art expression of the entire nation for as long as there's been Aboriginal art. There's there's always um, politi politics and protests embedded in art that you wouldn't think to see it in. Um, the Western desert art has had a strong protest element for the 50 years it's been going, for example. And and I, I do agree that art is a good way into, um, into uh, trying to s start the truth telling. And I, I, I also think that telling our stories are important and art can give people an entry point to our stories. And that's, that's important. I mean, my, my work is mostly as a storyteller, but my, um, I'm not sure, there's a lot of people out there who I'm not sure would have read my books if they weren't also interested in Aboriginal art. So I think art helps people get into the other parts of um, trying to understand Aboriginal culture. They see a beautiful work of art, they want to know more, and that starts the process of questioning um, their own understanding of what Australian history is. And I think that's something that comes out strong in uh, Marie's uh, work and, 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 and this latest um, exhibition. Um, how how important has uh, I guess activism and the act of defiance been in in your work collectively, Marie, and and in this exhibition? Oh well, I I just think that you know in twenty twenty one that we're still here, still practicing, and people are able to to see and read the stories that go along with that, and. You know, the mere fact that we're doing this in 2021 is an act of defiance. And, yeah, I, and I guess being the first living artist to have a solo exhibition at the National Gallery with ties, you know, 
to connection to country, culture and place is pretty incredible. And even though it's taken, you know, many, many years to get there, it's there, it's happening, people are seeing it, um, reading the stories. And I think it's a really sort of gentle way, if you like, even though I feel like the exhibition is quite big and emotional. Um, but to see the scale of loss of land, language and cultural practices told through through the artwork, um, I think people get it. <laughs> It may have taken a while for you to get to um to NGV, Marie, but you arrived just on time. So, uh, congratulations yeah. once again. Because you, we, I, I know through um uh, through uh, connections to community that uh, you're also very generous in giving your time and helping other artists come along and um, uh, you know, move forward with their journey too. So, um, you know, absolutely, you know, fantastic that uh, this exhibition's on. So, congratulations uh, once once again. Um. You mentioned loss, Marie, and I'll throw this open to to, to the panel. Um, is loss at basically the core of each one of our stories? Um, I know that we um, are, are not a particularly morbid people. We are we are uh, humorous. We like to have fun. We are playful, and these are all mechanisms to help deal with loss. But mm. is loss, when you think about it and boil it down, is that at the centre of our story? I think um, if we think about um, the history of this colony and of the history of Aboriginal rights in this colony, we have to accept that there's no Indigenous family that has not experienced some sort of loss. Firstly, from the loss of our sacred land and our sacred land rights and, and the loss of culture that comes from not being able to visit our sacred sites, but also from stolen children, stolen wages, um, Loss of loss of family, um, deaths in custody. Everything that has happened to us since the birth of the colony has involved loss. From the very first loss, where we went from owning all of this continent to owning um, very little of it, and particularly in the south of the continent, where um, land rights hasn't gotten very far. In in the Northern Territory, large chunks of land are owned by First Nations people, are owned by um, land, land councils. But in the south of Australia, where we all come from, um, we've lost nearly everything. We don't have um, significant access to land, so loss has always been there because um, our land is our culture and our land is our family and we don't have that. Miles, you, you, um, I read a piece from yours, you know, I think it was in the conversation from about 2017, and there's been a little bit in uh, the news this week about uh, the last uh, Tasmanian um, uh, tiger. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously the loss of a species is, is terribly sad and, and, you know, terrible for the ecosystem, etc. But you wrote a piece saying that about two years before that there was a, a portrait artist going around painting what were expected to be the last Aboriginal people in the um, in Victoria down at Lake Lake Tyres. Um, why don't we Why don't we acknowledge as a broader society that a man of loss? I mean, there are, and to use a, a colonial term, no full blooded Aboriginal Victorians uh, uh, left. Um, they were, you know, eradicated through. Um, Basically, dispossession, drug, um, um, uh, disease, um, alcohol, and the terrible half caste act of uh, the late nineteenth century. Um, uh, why, why don't we know as much about that, Miles, as we do about the thylacine? Yeah, the piece that you're um, you're referring to was a piece I read about Percy Leeson, uh, who produced a body of work that was called the last of the Victorian Aborigines. And it was a kind of photographic, um, uh, sorry, it was based on a, a series of photographs that were taken by Donald Thompson that he then painted of a series of people at Corandirk. And it was this kind of movement in art in the 19th century that was very much um, started in the 19th century and was rooted in this idea of salvage anthropology and trying to kind of preserve races before they went as I guess was popularly popularly expected extinct uh, of course we know that that's not how culture works and that's not how community works but um his his paintings were really powerful because you know I've seen the, the photographs that were taken by Donald Thompson 
which are very, you can get a real sense of the kind of power dynamic that exists between Donald Thompson and the people that he was photographing. And the, you know, one of the things I love about photography and, you know, particularly this comes out in, in Marie's work as well, is that while you could sense that Donald Thompson was clearly the one in, in power and he was the one who was um, exerting his authority over the people who he was um, turning into specimens and he was um, recording against a white wall with a yardstick. But at the same time, photography is always somehow connected to reality and subjects can and do stare back. And so the people who he was photographing also had agency and they also connect with us. And, you know, these photographs which were taken in, in the 30s and then painted in, in the paintings by Percy Leeson, we get this much more of a sense of the artist trying to create their own kind of whimsical um, portrait of what they think an extinction looks like, what they think a dying race looks like. But in the photographs, which are the same subjects taken, you know, in, in the same, same months, in those we get a real sense of people who are not moving and they're not going anywhere. And this romantic idea of extinction and this idea of salvage anthropology is completely made up and in the minds of the coloniser. And I guess, you know, to kind of bring that into the contemporary space, there's something so powerful about the way that Marie, you as an Aboriginal artist, pick up a camera and you decide the way in which that camera is used. And it's a really beautiful, well, to me, that's a really beautiful um, kind of conclusion to objects and records like that, particularly your ritual and ceremony series, which references that type of kind of early um, colonial photography where you have Aboriginal people against the wall being, you know, they were anonymised, but in your work they're not anonymised. Everyone is named, everyone is known, everyone comes into the gallery and they see their family on their wall. And it's a family it's a family photo album for many of us. So, you know, I guess for me there's a really beautiful kind of synergy there. Um, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, it does, it does. It, 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 that was a great answer. There's a lot of... Um, staring back from the portraits that uh, you, you you took and um, are displayed in the exhibition, um, Marie. Um, I see a lot of the people, um, if I don't know the people um, in, in the photos, I certainly relate to them and, and the way you can see that there's defiance, there's a bit of cheekiness, there's a bit of sadness in, in those mm. photos. Um, what was, what, what, What's your take out from, you know, now that you've taken those photos, they're, they're being exhibited and then you stand mm -hmm. back and you look at them as a, as a collective. What, what do you take away from the people in those photos? Oh, well, I, you know, number one, I just feel so privileged that I was um, able to make that body of work, which took me a couple of years to actually make. Um, I photographed all of the women in 2010 and then the men around 2012, I think it was. Um, but to be able to, to talk to everybody, and this is every single individual person that I took the photograph of, and I, I took photos of them all at the Curry Heritage Trust in the education room when it was on King Street. So every weekend for about three months, I would go in there and just, you know, call up different people and to talk through the process and what the work was about, um, which was about, you know, loss, mourning, sorrow, and explain the traditional mourning practices. And, you know, some people would just move to tears before I even started, like just mm -hmm. after explaining what the whole process was. And then to then paint their eyes with the white morning marking and put ochre through their hair, there was just this transformation. And I think that comes through in the eyes of some of the people that I was working with. And then to be able to get the stories from the different um, sitters, their story of lost sorrow and mourning, whether it was land, language, cultural practices or loved ones, um, mm. that, that was huge. Um, yeah. And what sort of, I mean, I think one thing that I, I wanted to explore, explore today is, you know, all three of you is telling these stories and bringing these stories to life. And, and the process that you just described, Marie, it takes, mm -hmm. it has to take a toll. What sort of toll did that take 
on you putting those taking those photographs getting those people to share their stories and then telling those stories to to the wider community what sort of toll did that take on on you um well considering you know i've lost three brothers myself fairly close together and you know mum dad had nieces and nephews suicide like all of these things you're thinking about when you're making this sort of work and when i walked in and saw the exhibition hey miles i i just sobbed my heart out for like 10 minutes i couldn't move couldn't speak and my husband was just there holding me um and it's the stories and memories of you know bringing everybody together to do that was was pretty incredible yeah and yeah. i don't know i think i think i generate i I channel all of that energy back into the next collection. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, you certainly, you certainly pulled it off. It's a very, very powerful um, uh, piece of piece of work. I um, might just move on to to your work, um, Claire. Your uh, new book, Lies, Damn Lies: A Personal Exploration of the Impact of Colonisation, is indeed your first work of uh, non-fiction, framed framed through your own personal experience. And obviously, through a truckload of in-depth research that you've um, undertaken, how much of a toll did taking that deep dive into the impacts of colonisation um, have on you? Well, initially, it took a toll during the process. Um, the book was written relatively quickly as well, so it was a very intense time during the process of writing the book. But as is so often the case in my um, in my artistic practice as a writer. During the process, um, I experienced significant catharsis as well. So mm -hmm. it, it, it took an emotional toll during the process, but after the process, it relieved my emotional, the, not only the emotion of, the, of having written it, of, of the process of writing it, but also it unpacked some of the emotional trauma that I was going through. I, I think in a way the emotional toll or the emotional labour is going to come not during the process of making the book, but the process of the community response to the book, because it's a, it's a, there's a lot of things I say in there that are in, that are fundamentally true, but in Australian um, kind of political circles, quite controversial. That the, um, the I think the emotional toll is going to take when going to occur when um, the mainstream becomes more aware of the work rather than in the process of producing it, in that the emotional labour from that book hasn't be, has not yet begun because the, the um, abuse of reviews from certain um, media, some of who are called out in the book because they need to be called out, the abuse of reviews have not yet landed. And once they do, then it will become hard. Yeah, I, 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 fear, I fear that you're right, especially as we're approaching uh, a federal election and once the the awareness of some of the things that you raise in this book come come out that will be um unfortunately fodder for a lot of the 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 i guess right wing warriors and cultural warriors that are fighting the tyson uh, uh cultural wars so um you know take care of yourself and look after yourself and uh, there'll be a lot of us behind you um <laughs> making sure that we've got your back when when that eventually happens um I think if someone so had to do the, it Someone had to do oh, it. Might as well be gonna, you, Claire. It might as well be might me. Well be so they'll, they'll got to come for one of us at some point. So I'm, I might as yeah. well stick my neck out. Um, so much of the book is about unpicking or debunking the stories told to generations of Australians. Um, I guess this is a question for, for, for all of us. All of us is How central is debunking the myths um, told about Aboriginal people um, central to modern Aboriginal storytelling? I think um, I think that this actually connects to the last question you asked around loss and the toll, because I think um, you know my experience of of working at the NGV and particularly if you walk through the Australian Historical Collection, which starts 
with the arrival of Cook. It starts in 1770, um, whereas we all know that the first chapter in Australian art started 65,000 years ago. Um, but if you walk through those Australian galleries and you see this kind of endless sea of horizon lines, depictions of the landscape by settler artists, and you, you get almost no sense of Aboriginal artists from the 19th century and from the early 20th century. We have a, you know, a collection of cultural objects, all by artists whose names weren't recorded. We have, very, you know, the beautiful works by William Barrack and Tommy McCree and Captain Harrison, but they're so rare in, in, in comparison. And then you go upstairs and you see Marie's work, and that antidote to absence is presence. And that presence of, you know, a show that is your name and that is filled with people with names and that this is the face of, you know, Aboriginal communities in the southeast today. I think that's all about smashing stereotypes and debunking myths because if you only walked through one of these galleries, you would get a very different sense of what you would think that, that you know, with the arrival of the British, that Aboriginal people stopped stopped existing you would you would think that and so i think it's really important that you know like i said the antidote to that you know absence is presence and it, whether it's a voice like claire or you know a body of work a body you know a career as, as an artist like marie that's um that's all about debunking myths and it requires the artist or the writer to to become very very vulnerable in in the work that they do. Um, Claire just mentioned, you know, the, the the toll that she's expecting, the backlash that she's expecting to to receive as a result of of her book. Um, Marie, with you, it's 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 a vulnerability, but in a in a different way. It's a vulnerability to to open up pretty much mm. every, I guess, um, uh, emotion every um uh memory that you that you have and that you've been able to to put down through through your art um mm. how vulnerable i mean how, how vulnerable do you have to be to 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 tell the truth in this country and to use that truth as an act of defiance yeah well oh. well for me it's like you know you're having to relive memory and then take that memory and turn it into art. Or sometimes I don't have the memory, but there's stories told to me by my oldest brother who passed a couple of years ago and my mother and, you know, stories from aunts and uncles of when we did live down by the riverbank and, you know, we lived in a tent, my bed was a suitcase, all pre-1967. So... Think about that time when there were a lot of Aboriginal families living on a riverbank, living in tents and humpies, and um, here we are in 2021, people are housed, but it's still overcrowded, you know, all that sort of stuff. And, yeah, sometimes it's, you know, it's a bit emotional, um, but the stories are there and need to be told because, yeah, I don't know any other way to sort of share cultural practice, knowledge and, and stories without, you know, pumping that into my artwork and, you know, putting it out there in another way. And, you know, like Miles said before, like art is a really good way to tell those really difficult stories. Um, and that way people are looking at these, <clears throat> pardon me, objects or items and taking away whatever they they can sort of interpret from that. Mm. I think I think um, uh, just to pick up on on something that both you and Claire have have, have said, and um, I think it's, it would apply to you as well, Miles, is that it's not a want so much to tell stories or to um, express ourselves through art. It's actually a need, and mm -hmm. and it's something that. Um, some of us who have the 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 ability or or the or the time or the bent to to tell these stories is it's not something that we necessarily want to do it's, it's something that um, some of us actually need to do not only um, for others but but for ourselves is is that a, a realistic statement I'll throw it open for me certainly it is I, I not only feel 
a need to express these stories and, and get them out and and in a way um, neutralize their their um, negative energy by by telling them. I feel better every time I tell one of these stories. So not only that, but um, I feel an obligation to use that um, that talent or whatever it is in a way that, in my opinion, will will improve the lives of our people. So I, I not only feel an, a personal need, but I also feel a social obligation to write. So um, I don't think there's um, a force on in this universe that could stop me writing because I have to do it. What about what about you, Miles? Yeah, I mean, I think that art and art making is just inherently important to all First Nations communities around the whole world, um, and a lot of that, you know, is because for forever this was that this was our way of communicating complex cultural information. This was the way that we passed down knowledge, storytelling, and art. And it's in the fabric and DNA of what it means to be, you know. I mean, I, I often hear like First Nations used as this kind of homogenized term to connect First Peoples all around the world, people who don't actually have anything in common, people from all different communities, um, kind of coming under this umbrella term of First Nations people. But the thing we do all have in common, I think, is art is so central to what it means to be a First Nations person. Because like I said, that's the way that we pass down all of our information for 65,000 years. And it, there's something so unbelievably moving seeing that come out as a lenticular or a hologram or a glass eel trap or, you know, that's the same knowledge, the same stories that are 65,000 years old but are being told now in new media by artists like Marie or being, you know, published in the words of the, you know, in the language of the coloniser by, by writers like Claire. I find that so powerful and, yeah. I'll tell you what, that, uh, that glass eel trap really is um, something else. So... Like I said, uh, if you want to check it out, you've got until February now. Thanks for letting us know, Miles. It's um, fantastic yeah. to get um, get down there and actually see it in in person. I'm I'm looking forward to that. Um, Marie, your art is it a is it a want or or a need from from you? Oh, I think it's a bit of both, and I feel like now I have an obligation to share that cultural knowledge and creative art practice with my family and with anybody who's willing to come to my home or a workshop and learn. You know, because I've spent years sort of travelling around the world, researching our material cultural items, learning how those objects and items were put together. Um, just recently my husband came back, you know, pre this last lockdown, three-day trip collecting kangaroo teeth, came home with like 118 teeth. Um, he has taught my nieces and nephews how to take the sinew out of the tail of a kangaroo. I've showed them how to put it together. I've taught cloak making to my nieces and nephews in the backyard, or especially to Mitch Marnie, my great nephew, who has then gone on to teach the other nieces and nephews in the backyard, you know, cloak making. And, you know, it, it's just part of who I am and what I do is to share that knowledge and, and experiences. I've had different artists come to my home and I've taught taught them how to make dance belts. Like I might, might make the initial um, strap, but then it's up to them how they adorn that to tell their story through this dance belt. Yeah, there's so many different ways and... You know, when I was doing photography in the early days, I've taken all of my nieces and nephews to the dark room and done that whole process of, you know, developing film and printing photos. So they've all had little bits and pieces of dabbling in my work. Um, even the poles in the city square um, where they're building the new metro tunnel, that was like 27 years ago. Well, my family were down from Muldura. I gave all the kids a brush. So they were also part of that whole process of painting the poles in the city square. Yeah. That seems to me as well uh, a thing that, you know, is 
it's not unique to uh, Aboriginal art, but it's certainly something that is central to it, and that is sharing the practice of creating art with with your family, with your community, uh, mm. where possible. So there's a collective ownership of um, mm. our, our cultural our culture, but also our art, and that's something that um, has has been really uh, a central piece of of of, you, of your work as an artist, Marie. Um, uh, have you had any of the people that you've um, collaborated with um, over the years come through the exhibition and, and what sort of, um, if any so, what sort of response have you had? Um, absolutely. Like I I met some of my family members um, in at the gallery. Um, they were waiting outside and wouldn't go in until I arrived. And they were also just moved to tears. You know, because just seeing family, my mum, my brothers that had passed and all that sort of stuff, but to see themselves reflected in the work and to see the objects and items that they had helped make, create, um, yeah, is, is just an incredible thing. And one of my new multimedia pieces where I had, you know, 10 of my nieces and nephews all become part of that from the one of the younger ones who was who's 60 six years old um and charlie who's eight and to have those kids walk in and see themselves you know as part of this artwork they're as proud as punch and it's just sharing these experiences and you know my house is like living in a studio so whenever the kids would come and stay they knew that they could get up in the morning and make whatever they wanted, whether it was a sculpture or a piece of jewellery or painting on canvas. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. So, Miles, um, you know, you would know far better than most people, of course. Um, the amount of emotion, the amount of uh, time, the amount of, the amount of effort and the amount of um, investment by a community in, into someone like um, Marie's work um, that places a very hefty responsibility on on someone like you to curate that and and mm. and present it to the public in a in a meaningful way as possible. Well, what are mm. some of the the basic principles that you use to when when presented with a body of work like this and making sure that you do it justice? I mean, it's a really good question. Um, I think that. In, in the case of Marie, it was significantly easier because I've known Marie for so long. And, you know, the first show I ever curated at Swinburne University back when I was in my, like, early 20s was a Dialogues lecture series with Marie. And, um, I'm you know, I'm in ritual and ceremony. And, you know, I've, I've known you for such a long time through family that I think it just... The collaboration, you know, and also Marie's a curator as well. Like, so it's not like I was in that case just trying to interpret your body of work and present it. It was a true collaboration. Um, but there's been plenty of artists that I've worked with over the years where, like, as you say, the um, community expectation to get it right is very high because once an artist is having a retrospective at the National Gallery of Victoria, they really are at the absolute peak of contemporary art like these are the artists who are the most cutting artists uh at the most cutting edge and at the absolute kind of height of australian contemporary art and with that comes uh, just a tremendous amount of of love from the community i think we got it right with marie's show um i think a really important part of that was having the book the catalog which um is the record of the show and outlives the show in a lot of ways um and yeah, so I think, how do you tackle that? It depends, case by case, but it's much easier, I find, when you're working with living artists. Uh, wow, it's both easier and more challenging. Let me be totally frank. <laughs> it, it can also have its challenges. But um, it, it, for me, it's easier because not, everyone, past, not, everyone, so not everyone's as wonderful as Marie, I'm, I'm guessing. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But in the past, I think there's been a kind of um, tendency to work with artists who, um, yeah, for like big institutions to work with artists who weren't necessarily able to um, explain exactly or, you know, or who 
who, where the curator was the one who was the expert. I'm not the expert in Marie's work and I never will be. Marie's the expert in her work and she's here sitting in front of us to talk about it. So I think, you know, my job in that regard is to make space and to hand the microphone to the right person. Well, uh, well, um, it's on top of my mind. Marie's um, official exhibition catalogue is available at the NGV Design Store. So um, if you want to get a hold of that, it's beautifully produced and it looks wonderful. So um, that's another place you can go to um, to, to get some goodies. It would uh, make um, uh, a wonderful gift, but, um, you know, good for yourself as well. Um, There's a wonderful essay in there by Claire, which, um, there is. which I... I I want to kind of give a shout out to as well because um, you were talking about how Marie's work is so much about memory and it is, but, you know, in the same way, there's this beautiful speculative sci-fi piece that Claire's written, which kind of ties the memory of past, present and future into this infinite loop. And she imagines this world of, of Aboriginal people who have taken to the stars and are, you know, moving through wormholes in giant eel traps. And it's a kind of wonderful way to imagine deep time, both in the future and in the past. What was, what was your um, uh, initial thoughts when you were approached to write that piece, Claire? <laughs> well, it's, it's because Miles asked um, a speculative fiction piece on... Um, on Murray Clark, in, inspired by Murray Clark's um, glass eel traps, and my first my question back to Miles was, "Yeah, sure, as long as, um, as long as you don't mind, essentially Aboriginal space opera." And Miles said, "Absolutely, I'd love some Aboriginal space opera." <laughs> um, it was a, it's 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 challenging to to come up with um, a speculative fiction short story inspired by an artwork, but in a way, the the challenge of of coming up with um, with something inspired by something else is a good challenge. Um, uh, writing your latest piece, though, Claire, um, which I happen to have a copy of here. I'll hold it up to the camera. There you go. Lies, damn lies. Um, what, uh, out of all the various issues that you tackled and all the um, the, the myths that you, you debunked and um, all the research you did, what was something that, genuinely surprised you that you didn't know before you went into that project? There's something I'd, I'd heard rumours of that I, I checked whether the rumours are true. And the thing I heard rumours of was um, people saying that um, the evidence is strong that Island. I heard rumours of this. Um, well, um, hearing the rumours, I'd check it. And indeed, the evidence does suggest there was actually no such declaration, that they were actually, it was actually added to um, Cook's diaries later when they were edited for publication, because Banks also wrote a diary made no mention of it. And that, was, that yeah. surprised me that there was no mention in um, Joseph Banks' diaries of, um, of, the, of Cook taking possession of Australia. So, Because you would mention the, it, wouldn't you? You would mention you would, it. You would. <laughs> you'd, you'd certainly mention Cook said. Cook oh, said the they, they were, yeah, Cook, yeah, Cook said we raised the flag and we fired a volley of, of musket and we were answered with a volley from the ship of cannon. And that's basically what Cook said. But Banks said we climbed a hill and looked and saw passage to the, to the west. And th this, they don't make any sense when you put them together. And yet when you look at something horrible, which is <clears> – um, Cook firing at the first Aboriginal person he saw in Australia, they both wrote about that. So they mm. both wrote about the a, a basically a crime against humanity that Cook performed, but only Cook's diary mentioned the um, the claiming of Australia, which which suggests to me that it never actually happened. And the interesting thing about that too, Claire, is that um, uh, in terms of uh, the, the British class system, it was, it's Banks that was uh, the senior senior person on that um, particular uh, uh, voyage and, and Cook was someone that in British society was was um, seen as less than him at the time. So, yeah, it, it is very telling that, that Banks didn't make mention of that. It's also really telling that Cook wasn't even a captain. He was the yeah. master of a vessel, but he wasn't. He hadn't received the rank captain yet. He was a lieutenant. He was the lowest ranked officer you can have in the British Navy at the time. So, um, the myths about Cook just drive me insane because Australians have no idea who Cook was and what actually happened. Yep, and um, I guess that's 
bringing us back to the central theme of this discussion, and that is, you know, defiance through through the act of uh, through the act of writing and through the expression of um, art. Um, speaking of um, art, Marie, if someone watching this now was to go to your exhibition, there are many things to take away from it, of course, but. What would be, I guess, if there was one thing that you would want someone to take away from the exhibition once they'd um, had the chance to view it, what would that be? That hopefully, <clears throat> pardon me, hopefully that they realise that it's a continuation of 65,000 plus years of making, creating and designing and sharing that knowledge and you know, hopefully it's inspiring other people to go out there and and make and create and share their stories. I think that's I think that's um, a very good summation. I, I would also venture to to add that it it highlights the fact that uh, Aboriginal culture is not stagnant and it, it's something that um, uh, continues to to evolve and that comes across um, very strongly. In, in your work, Marie, um, Miles, would you would you agree with that in terms of the exhibition that it's a it's a body of work that shows um, evolution of culture as much as um, uh, I guess uh, preservation of culture? Absolutely, and you know, in one part of that, we have to thank uh, the Museum Victoria. Who, had, who offered some really key loans that I think in a lot of ways um, helped to drive home that point. You know, we have the possum skin cloak um, collected from Echuca, uh, one of, you know, fewer than, than five in the world um, that exist from, from, from the 19th century. And then we have the wonderful um, historical kangaroo tooth necklace and river reed necklace and also Kopi. Uh, and to have those in dialogue with Marie's work, absolutely. Um, you know, I mean, we, we we talk about this idea of a continuum, and yes, you can you can sense a continuum through things like you know the wonderful essay essay that Claire wrote for the catalogue. But nothing to me um, highlights that more than seeing a contemporary copy next to the historical copy. Mm. That shows nice. that presence is here and that this continuation is here. And and then to take it again and to, you know, transform these customary objects into new media and glass and 3D printed, you know, polymer resin and, and, and gold plated, you know, kangaroo teeth and lenticular prints and this kind of absolute transf transformation of the customary and the classical into new media, I think that shows the continuum um, very beautifully. You mentioned the copy, Miles. I might get you just for the people at home to um, uh, explain, Marie, what, what a copy is and, and why you decided to include it in the exhibition. Well, yeah, when oh, Miles sort of suggested that we try and borrow some objects from, from the Melbourne Museum, one of which is um, the Kopi morning cap. But yeah, just to see this continuation of, of culture and practice. And the last time I, I had actually seen um, the historical Kopi morning cap was when I had my um, a solo show at the Melbourne Museum. And we'd borrowed, I think, three Kopi morning caps. And so to see that, that object in its lone on its own little glass case opposite my copies of with the men and women yeah it was so powerful. really really powerful yeah yeah let me yeah. um let me ask another question here um and it's a question to all three of you um i'll probably get you to start off with with your answer first claire um how hopeful how hopeful are you about the future um uh of our people basically and, and how important will the act of storytelling and um, artistic expression be to the future of our, of our people at this place and time um, with so many challenges uh, being thrown at us from colonialism? I, I tend to um, have a, um, a particular attitude towards um, hope. I'm, I always consider myself to be, in almost anything, pessimistic but hopeful. 
and that I expect the worst but, but hope for the best. I, I think um, we're at a time now where things can go either way. Um, things could get better or they could get a lot worse. Um, there seems to be a, a strong kind of anti, um, I suppose you could say anti egalitarian drive in society at the moment where people want um, to strip us of what rights and equality we have. But there does seem to also be an awakening, a certain amount of awakening among um, um, non-Indigenous people seeing what this colony really is and beginning to question it and beginning to awaken to a, a non-racist or even anti-racist point of view. Now, I think that that art and our writing and our, our, our visual art, our films, our books is a large part of that awakening. What about you, uh, Miles? Where do you think we, we are at the moment in terms of hope and how well-placed are we to, um, to, to tackle some of the challenges that continue to face us? I feel like it's a, it's a, it's a difficult question to ask, answer in 2021 in, you know, 220 days of lockdown or whatever it is because, you know, day by day I, I tend to feel, you know, hopeless one day and hopeful the next one thing that I am really hopeful of is, and and I do see continuing is that, you know, Marie, Marie, you're the first living artist with ancestral connections to the southeast to have a solo at NGV. You are not the last. And that is something that I am very confident about and I am very hopeful for. And I see... Um, change happening uh, in the museum sector and in the gallery sector at a rate that is really, really positive and really hopeful. And just the amount of um, just support that I'm seeing for Aboriginal storytellers and artists. And that's particularly one, you know, one area where I do, I do feel hope and I do see positive change so you know don't ask me about climate change or about you know the rest of the states of the world but within the arts there's there's a lot of hope yeah. and marie what about you where, where where are you on hope oh i'm always hopeful and i always hope that you know people will do the right thing and you know Everything's a bit of a challenge at the moment, but in saying that, I see this next generation coming through where I think, you know, everything will be safe in the future. Um, because for myself, um, I'm also working on a living archive of Aboriginal art with you know, mob here in Victoria, but also working with Nuka mob up north. And I do a lot of work with my great nephew, Mitch Marnie, and we've been shooting these little mini docos just on our mobile phones and sharing these culture and practices with the mob up there, but using technology that the kids can use and record and get stories of from their elders and, and what they're doing. So I think the more we share all of these stories, culture, knowledge, everything, and pass that on to the next generation and further down, that, yeah, there there is hope for the future. Mm. I think that um, there, is a, there is a groundswell in interest and I think there is a growing number in terms of support for for Aboriginal people, our causes and um, and our work, but I also sense, and I think um, it goes back to sort of what you were saying earlier, Claire, that there does seem to be um, a growing opposition to um, truth telling in this country. There seems to be, um, uh, you know, a whitewashing of history that has been around for a long time, but it seems to be coming becoming um, more vivid as we head further and further into the 21st century, and we have the likes of uh, Facebook and uh, Trumpians and um, uh, some of the Australian politicians that we have to put up with in this country wanting to tell um, a distorted truth about the, about the history of this country. But I would suggest that we are probably better equipped now to continue to defy 
those um, those lies and to continue on with our story because of the likes of you three um, through the, the the vivid storytelling that you present to us, uh, Claire, through the amazing um, artistic and body and lifelong work that uh, you present to us, Marie, and to you, Miles, just from being deadly and just making sure that um, our culture continues to thrive and survive uh, through through your work. So I, I thank all three of you for, for the amazing um, uh, work that you have done and continue to do. And um, I thank you for your time today. I'm going to um, uh, make sure that uh, I, I tick off on a few points here. So Ancestral Memories is on at the Ian Potter Centre at the National Gallery of Victoria until February, uh, which is uh, fantastic news. So we'll be able to uh, get along and um, see that in person at some point, if all goes to plan. But uh, we know what plans are in this country at the moment. Um, if you want to actually go and have a look at the virtual tour, you can go to ngv.vic.gov.au slash virtual tours and you'll see um, Marie's um, an option to see Marie's work um, there. And if you want to go and pick up uh, her um, official exhibition catalogue, and in, within that is Claire's wonderful um, essay, and you just go to the NGV Design Store um, to, to purchase that. And if you want to get a copy of Lies, Damn Lies, that is out now, and it is available through um, the bookseller for this event, the Hill of Content Bookshop. And if you want to um, uh, purchase a copy of that online and get it delivered to you, then just go to hillofcontentbookshop.com. Uh, um, any last words um, from, from you wonderful people before we uh, sign off? I, I just want to say, um, that Daniel, that we um, you're saying that we're all fighting hard and we're all deadly. Well, your your work in broadcasting is deadly and important and social writing, and I think we need to acknowledge that um, that you're fighting the good fight as much as the rest of us are. Oh, thank you very much, Claire. Cheers. Well, with um, with uh, that love fest, <laughs> we will um, uh, we we will um, uh, finish up uh, the, this evening slash today wherever you are. Uh, thank you for your time. I hope it's been uh, useful to you. And uh, go out and uh, talk about this amongst your friends and share those stories because we are. Thank you. Awesome. Bye now. Thank you. See ya. Thanks. <laughs> Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and around the world.